All right. So, um, so Matthew was sort of talking about uh, the beyond Planck analysis, and I think um, that this uh, art of looking at an established data set uh, sort of inspired us to look at the, the previous established data set that is WMAP. And so I'll start off by just talking a little bit about why we're why this is a useful thing to do and some of the results that we have so far. So for those of you who uh, need some review, um, WMAP um, observed from 2001 to 2010, and it's a sort of a complementary experiment to the Planck low frequency instrument. Um, has uh, similar frequency bands, um, slightly higher noise, slightly lower resolution, but it, uh, it has very, sort of a complementary uh, um, comparable constraining power to the Planck low frequency instrument. And perhaps more importantly, it has a very different observing strategy than the Planck low frequency instrument. So Planck LFI and WMAP are going to have very different systematics, very different uh, poorly measured modes. Um, so this uh, means that a joint analysis would sort of allow for both these degeneracies to be broken. Uh, and another reason why it's worth doing this is because uh, on Lambda, there is a very detailed, very uh, comprehensive uh, documentation of how the WMAP analysis was done in the first place. So it is actually quite easy um, comparatively to reproduce the WMAP analysis. And we're not the first people who have done this, but uh, perhaps the first people who do it in this joint Bayesian framework. So when I talked about the observing strategy, um, WMAP uh, is a differential instrument. Uh, it has two horns, so it subtracts the intensity from one point in the sky, from another point in the sky, it's separated about 140 degrees. And uh, it covers large fractions of the sky in about six months period or so. Um, so basically you're able to get very good polarization coverage on most of the sky, and um, you can characterize it systematic very well. Um, and so then, you know, just sort of to be blunt, like why, you know, why do we still care about the WMAP data? And part of it is um, the complementary frequency coverage is vital. Um, the K band 23 gigahertz um, uh, map in polarization uh, is pretty much the best synchrotron, polarized synchrotron template that we have. Um, and it's also useful for breaking degeneracies and anomalous microwave emission, which is polarized synchrotron. Um, I mentioned before, there's different instrumental systematics. So WMAP can help Planck, well, Planck can help WMAP. Um, and the third point is there are still some differences between the WMAP and Planck data. For example, there's a large you know, polarization differences and it's important to figure out why this is the case. They're both observing the same sky. Why is the data different? Um, and then of course, um, it's absolutely vital to include all the data that we have to uh, characterize the galactic foregrounds. Um, Planck LFI is not enough, WMAP is not enough, um, and all the most robust models come from a combination of them. So it's important to understand the entire data set that we're using, especially as the hunt for B modes intensifies. So um, the first step in any model uh, in, when you're GIP sampling is to uh, create an explicit data model. So here um, we have sort of the gain, um, factor G, um, the, the brightness of the sky at a point T, or the point P of A or the coordination angle of gamma. And of course, there's two beam transmission coefficients, alpha IA and alpha IB. Um, and these are, these will come back later, but this basically parameterizes the fact that uh, it basically deviations from non-idealities non -idealities of the two horns. If one horn has a slightly higher gain than the other, this could induce a spurious signal. And uh, in fact, this is, uh, this is the source of the largest uh, remaining large-scale polarized signal in WMAP. Um, one thing that we needed to deal with uh, when we were analyzing command, uh, Planck data in Commander 3 was the fact that the uh, map making was a little bit different. So the sort of classic uh, single horn instrument, uh, you, have a, you have a data model and you can uh, use this to create the um, maximum likelihood solution for the sky map being observed in a time stream. Um, and if you have differential data, um, it's basically the same thing, except now you have two horns. So you are looking at more data A minus data B. Um, and the mathematics is the same, except now you have a matrix that is non-diagonal. 
So whereas in the single horn case, you could solve for that pixel by pixel independently, in the, um, in the differential horn case, you need to do a full matrix inversion. And we needed to develop a conjugate gradient solver to solve for the mapping in, in WBAT. And so this was, uh, this was one of the biggest uh, sort of additions in time. And actually, I'll go into that later in terms of timing. But yeah, this was uh, important to pull out. Um, so the data themselves are actually quite uh, lightweight already. Um, Matthew was talking about eight terabytes of data. Um, the raw TOD for WMAP is about 626 gigabytes. Um, but uh, the data themselves are um, discretized, but highly discretized. So we can use Hoffman compression to um, reduce the size of the raw data by about a factor of four. So in terms of RAM requirements, it is possible to hold all 10, um, all 10 differencing assemblies from WMAP in uh, one node at a time, which is 200 gigabytes of data. And uh, we've made this available as a product um, at the URL here. Um, and uh, we'll be making this uh, link available, the, the link to the presentation available afterwards if you want to peruse this at your leisure. Um, so this is, um, we actually did write up this um, as a preliminary analysis and um, was submitted to uh, a and about, uh, yeah, about two months ago. Um, and uh, since then, uh, we've actually figured out a lot more stuff. So these are going to represent the current state. So the, a lot of this stuff is going to be approved from the paper. I still recommend that you read the paper. There's going to be a lot of updates um, in the, the next revision. But, uh, but yeah, a lot of this has um, been discussed already. Um, so there were a couple of things that we wanted to do. Um, for one thing, um, there's slight differences between how the WMAP team analyzed data and Commander 3 analyzed the data. Uh, for one, uh, the correlated noise model is a little bit different. Um, Commander 3, by default, has a 1 over F noise parameter, whereas WMAP had a uh, time space autocorrelation function that they used. Um, and uh, uh, another useful thing is that Commander actually generates a correlated noise time order data set that WMAP didn't do. Um, the baseline estimation is slightly different. Question of whether or not you're using a cubic polynomial versus a linear trend. Um, the imbalance parameters are actually solved for quite differently, and that WMAP uh, solved for them pretty much once a day, whereas we had a single value, um, uh, a single value that we sampled throughout the entire experiment, treating them as a constant. Um, there's also the calibration method, whereas a WMAP had a physical model for the game parameters um, as a function of housekeeping, whereas we're using the sky model to calibrate the data through the iterative process. We also include the solar dipole and the final maps. Um, and I think the final thing, which uh, uh, makes the really give us a lot of extra power, is that we're using WMAP and Planck foreground information in this, uh, in this analysis, whereas the 2013 Ben et al. paper used only WMAP foreground information for their um, analysis. So in, in some sense, you need to uh, decide um, what data is correct to use. And uh, for now, we're using WMAP as Planck, but there will be papers coming up talking about the effect of this choice. So how much does this actually cost? Uh, well, um, for Q1 band, which we start with, it's about 15 gigabytes on disk. It takes about 70 seconds to read in all this data. Takes about 10 seconds to do a single uh, conjugate gradient iteration for the map making step. Um, so you do that about 20 times, 200 seconds. And for a typical core on our cluster, it takes about 1200 seconds to get a single Gibbs iteration that is processing the Q1 band once, um, which is um, this is sort of an upper limit because I didn't know Fortran when I started this project. And so a lot of the things that have not been optimized uh, very well and they'll be. Probably we have at least a factor of two that we can improve this on. So keep stay tuned for that. Um, we also have sky model for the TOD, which generally looks quite good. Um, the orange line here is the baseline plus the correlated noise. And the blue line is with the sky model, where all these black dots are the raw data in digitalness. So the residuals in the data are generally very, um, very well distributed, um, described by Gaussian distribution. So so we're pretty happy with that right here. But of course, um, we're doing this iterative solution. And uh, because we're still figuring stuff out, um, we're 
it's actually still in the burn-in phase for some of the printers. For example, on the right here, we have a plot of from top to bottom of the gain, the knee frequency of the noise model, the slope of the noise model, um, the standard deviation of the TOD and digital units, and then the relative chi-squared um, on the bottom. And so as you can see, there's still a slight drift going on here, but the gain is quite steady. So um, basically what we're seeing the, is that we are able to, to describe the data very well, but there's just a question of whether or not the noise model is correct. And in fact, we are using a different noise model from WMAP, so that's going to be that's going to be the focus of the upcoming paper. Uh, one kind of interesting thing here is that there are six month sort of uh, variations in the noise parameters as well as the uh, um, perhaps the gain, and this is generally due to just temperature variations in the satellite. Um, and so we're actually, and again, for the game, we're able to reproduce the um, official WMAP game solutions quite well, um, considering that they have the physical parametric model for the game, whereas we're sampling based off of uh, sky. Um, and uh, we're able to get all the fluctuations in these little um, bumps. But uh, when you take the difference uh, and look at the relative amount, um, Basically, as a, this is a plot, this GIF is a function of Gibbs iteration. And uh, we are within 1% of the, um, the official solution, but there is an overall slope difference between the two. And this is, again, something that we need to understand completely. But uh, in general, um, half, like within a percent difference, uh, uh, it's a pretty good start. Um, so now that we actually have the gain solution, we're able to do the map making. And so uh, right now, this is a GIF flipping between the WMAP official solution and the commander um, uh, processing if you want to test the map. And it's, uh, I would be, uh, kudos to you if you can see the difference in the pixels on this map. It's a very good agreement. Um, in polarization, um, you can see the differences a little bit um, more clearly. Um, uh, there's a little bit more power in the WMAP solution. And um, I'll get back to that in a moment. But uh, when you take uh, in the temperature, the difference between the WMAP and Q1 and the commander Q1 processing is two microkelvin in uh, temperature. So we're pretty satisfied with that. There's still this quadrupole feature that we want to understand. Um, perhaps it's due to the kin kinematic dipole, but um, we're still, again, um, a nice start. To microfilming. Uh, we also um, did a difference map with um, rather than fitting for our own gain, um, used the WMAP um, pre calibrated data and ran that through our um, pipeline. And in that case, we get a five microfilming difference. Um, so um, this is again something that we want to make sure that we understand completely. But um, Again, the, the question, the differences between two and five microfilm differences in temperature. So this is pretty nice. Now polarization, um, this pattern may look familiar to some of you. Um, this is a, we have this four microfilm difference in the Q-band data. Um, and this is uh, what the WMAP team calls poorly measured modes uh, that are induced by um, small uncertainty in the imbalance template. So um, Jurosic 2007 describes these uh, um, essentially small uncertainty in the transmission imbalance for, between the two different forms can induce very large um, uh, fluctuations. Uh, specifically, uh, there's this mode on the top here that's due to um, uh, essentially the solar dipole. The solar dipole coupled with an uh, incorrect, um, um, incorrect uh, transmission balance terms can induce a signal that looks like this. And um, when you use the WMAP uh, low uh, multipole data, uh, they provide a N side of 16 pixel pixel covariance matrix that explicitly projects out these modes because they knew that these modes were not well measured. Um, and so this is sort of a post, um, a post analysis correction that the WMAP team made. Um, so the commander approach is a little bit different because we are sampling over the transmission balance. Um, we should actually be able to see uh, these moments come and go and essentially marginalize over them. Um, in addition, through a joint TOD analysis with WMAT and Planck, we should be able to better measure these moments directly and so perhaps break these degeneracies and get, uh, make these poorly measured moments well measured moments. Um, 
there's uh, still some some interesting uh, um, question marks left. For example, uh, commander sideload model creates um, something that looks quite like these imbalance modes, um, albeit with a, about a factor of 10 smaller. Um, but uh, it's, so, but uh, this is generally, um, this is likely due to the coupling of these solar dipoles, just a dipole component of the sideload model. But um, we could talk about that later if, you, if you're interested. Um, and then finally, we were just curious, like, is this actually in the WMAP data or is this in the commander reprocessing of it? And uh, essentially by rescaling, um, using the K-band for WMAP as a synchrotron template and tracking it, we're able to see that um, essentially, no, there's, we don't have these poorly measured modes in the commander reprocessing of the WMAP data, but it is in the WMAP data. So our hypothesis now is that because we're using this plank information, it's allowing for cleaner identification of the poorly measured modes in the WMAP data than was available in the initial data analysis. Um, so one night, one of the reasons that I think some of you might have been wondering why are you talking about Q-band? Um, the answer to that is that there are there's actually two differencing assemblies, Q1 and Q2, which are very similar but not identical pass bands. And um, you can check consistency in the WMAP versus WMAP processing versus commander processing. And um, essentially in the commander processing, we see that there's a little bit of difference along the galactic plane, which I would say you'd expect. Um, if, two, if you're looking at two different bands, slightly different band passes, the galactic plane is where most of the SED changes very quickly. Um, and uh, one of the really nice things we can see is that there's really excellent consistency in the commander solution at the high latitudes, and I would argue better than in the original WMAP process data. Um, and so at this sort of, so essentially, like we're, this is, I say the best evidence that we have so far that we are doing comparable, if not better, than the original dumping that analysis. Um, if you read the previous paper, um, one of the main issues that we had was the temperature sideload model. Um, we had didn't have it correct before, um, and we found uh, essentially there was a, a coordinate system issue. But now we're able to reproduce it through the auxiliary. Um, and the left is the auxiliary output from commander directly on the right is the um, predicted silo output from the WMAP team in 2003. So, so this is, uh, again, good news for us. Um, now, one of the things that commander does that WMAP didn't have is that we have these uh, other products, I think, as Matthew mentioned. So one of them is, for example, correlated noise plots. So we're able to take the correlated noise um, that is estimated for each time stream and just map uh, map it out and um, correlated noise essentially if there's anything in the data that is not modeled uh, by the that is not uh, explicitly included in the model it will be sucked up by the correlated noise so it's uh, lovingly called the trash can of our CD analysis um, and uh, in the temperature map in Q1 we're it's a uh, you know plus or minus one micro Kelvin if there's something else in the model, it's very difficult to see. Um, and you know, at one microcalvin level, we're doing a pretty good job. Um, you can also see this in a polarization. So in polarization, it's close to plus or minus five microcalvin. Um, and there's a polarization we also found is that it's kind of sensitive to how exactly you treat the baseline. So this is something we want to make sure that we get right. Um, but we are seeing sort of a uh, striping along the WMAP scanning path. Um, and that you can see very clearly the regions where um, there's a lot of polarization angle coverage. Um, and if you smooth the map even more, um, you can see um, you can see that there is actual large scale structure in the correlated noise that we haven't completely figured out yet, but um, it's at a pretty low level, plus or minus two and a half microcolor. Another um, important um, a product from the WMAP from the commander analysis is the residual. So you can see that uh, across almost the entire sky and temperature, we are we are measuring just about everything pretty well except uh, point sources are not doing so well. And you can also see that there is um, there's some jump going on at the black plane, uh, which uh, I think both of these are um, 
essentially to be expected um, for a parametric analysis like this. Uh, uh, the, the polarized map um, is also very clean. Um, there's a slight signal on the galactic Q, and uh, there's also some residual. You, you can see it's a little bit noisier along the ecliptic, which makes sense considering the polarization angle coverage. Um, uh, but yeah, the, uh, the residual um, in polarization, again, looks quite nice. Um, and then finally, um, one of the, the best things that you can get out of uh, the commander run is an actual ensemble map. So for every Gibb sample, you were getting a specific realization of the CMD map. And so you were able to, if you wanted to use the, anal the data of this analysis, you would use one map at a time to sort of fully propagate the errors from this analysis into the final results. So, so this is essentially equivalent to um, projecting out noise matrices um, uh, in the large scale, projecting out poorly measured modes. But this is sort of a more clean example um, and would argue sort of more physically um, easy to see where everything's coming from. So yeah, and it allows again for straight end-to-end -end error propagation. Now, um, we are also looking at the K-band. Um, and this one, we I, I want to back up and say, for the previous analysis, we simply used the beyond Planck um, sky model to calibrate the Q-band. Um, for the K-band, uh, we specifically added um, component separation. So essentially, running component separation jointly with the time order data processing for the K-band. So what you're about to see is what happens when you allow for the uh, joint sampling of the TOD with the mass itself, essentially the calibration source. So, so it begins in temperature. Again, it's very nice, um, um, hard to see the difference between the two. Um, in, in polarization though, there's a, the differences are quite a bit more clear and um, a lot of this is due to the poorly measured modes that are marginalized over in Commander. Um, and uh, when you look at the differences, you get, um, again, color ranges that are on the order of plus or minus in micro color. Um, and then just to sort of reiterate the point of this, uh, this analysis, like we are um, sampling over the imbalanced parameters, so you're able to see how much of the sky is changing depending on the actual choice of the imbalance templates. So these are the first 50 GIF samples of the run. And uh, you can see that there is still a very consistent structure in the difference between the commander and the W map reanalysis, even though the specific shape of it and size is fluctuating a little bit. Um, and so a lot of these signals look quite similar. I mean, we saw this from Matthew's talk um, when you compared the plank with the BP LFI map versus the W map K band. And then, the, then I show again the commander K band versus the W map K band. So a lot of these uh, poorly measured modes are appearing yet again. And uh, you can see them again, just like looking at the poorly measured modes from Jurosic, um, that a lot of these signals are popping up again. So um, one could argue that we should be, um, in fact, we, we probably will, for full comparison, project out these modes as a post hoc correction. Um, just to make sure that we're having a fair comparison between the two uh, approaches. But um, it's it's a pretty nice validation, I think, of this approach. And the, again, the fact that we're not seeing this in the correlated noise or the residuals shows that um, where we are able to remove the poorly measured modes in the commander analysis. So to summarize, Commander 3 is currently able to run the WMAP TOD successfully. Um, and it costs about 10 minutes per sample per channel. Um, and it's a sort of comparable analysis to the um, W method, to the beyond plank LFI analysis. Um, we also had the, the T silo pro problem um, that we discovered that the bug in our code and fixed that. Um, we have some promising pr uh, preliminary results. Um, of course, we're biased, but we think that our results look a little bit better in terms of channel consistency. Um, and uh, basically through the analysis of like removing these poorly measured modes or not removing, uh, measuring these uh, balanced modes, we can uh, explain the remaining discrepancy between plank and W map after this analysis. 
Um, and then of course, you know, this is, um, this is going to sort of be a test of like how useful it is. And I think hopefully I've shown that you can get more out of a joint analysis than you can from individual analyses um, just by the nature of orthogonal data sets being analyzed in tandem with each other. Um, any degeneracies that you get from one experiment can be broken by the other. Um, and of course, this is why, why we're here and why we're holding this conference to sort of show that this is a useful and important thing to do. Um, and of course, you know, there's a lot of work to be done and uh, I'm looking for volunteers. Um, so for example, um, we want to optimize the WMAP module. If you're good at Fortran and you know ways to speed up Fortran code, um, there's a paper on that there for you. Um, I would have shown the WMAP if it looked good. It doesn't look good. So if anybody wants to get on a paper with that, please sign up and uh, um, we'll be a high level author on that. We also need to fix the noise model. Um, there's sort of a high frequency noise in the WMAP data that we need to address. Um, currently, the one hour of noise isn't sufficient. And then finally, band pass sampling. Uh, we need to introduce band pass sampling similar to the beyond pipe analysis. But the, the main point is um, this, this analysis has been ongoing, it's been very exciting, and uh, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And uh, very happy to have anyone join us. And with that, thank you again for Cosmo Globe and uh, basic cosmology, beyond plank, et cetera, for giving me the funding to do this work. So with that, I'll take any questions.